so they can actually enforce law. So we can standardize contracts. We have a whole bunch of lawyers that are, that are figuring out the best ways of doing contracts, but there will still be one foot in the traditional world where you'll probably have to sign DocuSign contracts and say that you agree that assets are on the blockchain, you agree that the transactions that you are doing are immutable and legally binding, things of that nature. Maybe a time, but for now, we have to realize that, that uh, lawyers still apply. And finally, the consideration. No deal is valid until there's actually been consideration for whatever you're purchasing. Consideration is oftentimes cash, but in this case, we now have cryptocurrency, which could be traded relatively instantly. You automate all of those processes, and you've now broken down the barriers to ownership on micro scale. You can buy 0.005% of the cost, and it makes it worthwhile to do it. You can buy uh, $10 worth of office building in Montreal because it makes sense to do it, because the, the, the cost of the transaction was relatively low, or almost nothing. So if you make you know, your 10% on 10 bucks, yeah, okay, you made a buck, but, but maybe to a guy in Uganda, that's, that's something. You know, it's, it, it, it brings asset classes and, and investment opportunities, and the uh, trustless ownership to populations that had no access before. You know, we're all the way down to investing one dollar to one million dollars to one million dollars. So the way that we uh, think about it is that there's uh, a bit of a triangle. The automated escrow is what gets rid of the middleman, and really that's where we step in. Is that, that uh, our process has a series of smart contracts, logic, oracles, things that say why the transaction can happen. Throw in some legal legalese in there as well, and what that allows is for the transaction to to be enabled between the buyer and the seller. Our goal is to be completely hands off, but we do not have custodial ownership of the asset or the, uh, the uh, consideration, the cryptocurrency. And by doing that, when you get hands off, you also uh, don't step in a lot of uh, legal landmines of money transmitter rules and uh, broker tools. So um, that's what the key is to, is that once you can remove yourself and get things to be automated, it helps a lot with the legal aspect. Uh, I'll open up for questions. I think we do have, I'm not quite sure, about five minutes? Uh, two minutes. Okay, so, uh, so we have a two minutes with a two minute workflow. Go, go for it. Who wants to ask a, a question? I'm all that. Somebody's got to have a question. I'm going to start picking up people who I actually know who are in the back row. Do you see any comparison between fractional shares yeah. and fractional digital ownership? Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, Sometimes they're, they're the same, sometimes they're not. A share, a lot of times we think of like a corporation, where the share itself uh, is regulated by the uh, SEC. The share itself has some sort of value, as opposed to a digital representation of ownership, which in case, you may have just a digital ledger that says who owns what percent, and it may not actually be represented by, by an actual token that can be swapped between people. So if I just have a piece of paper that says everybody in that log to everybody in this room as to who owns what assets, that's not a tokenism. But if I put that, that ledger on blockchain, it's still an immutable ledger. It's not necessarily a token, but it still achieves the same goal of tracking who owns what. You see what I mean? As opposed to actually creating a token that people can put in wallets and then transfer, then you start stepping into a whole new world of cryptocurrency where, where it hasn't fully been figured out how they, they regulate those. I worked at a program for yeah. many years, and we did a fraction share. We actually had the whole, for every fraction, there's one person who was tracking the other whole. Exactly, yeah. And I don't know if, in this scenario, it seems like you're taking and you're dividing up assets that already exist. Yeah, yeah, so the assets already exist. Uh, yeah, so the assets already a whole. And one thing I didn't get into is that. There's also possession rights. There's also how much you can fractionalize. It doesn't make sense for a person who's possessing, say, a piece of art to fractionalize more than 50% of it because then you start getting a question of who actually has possession rights. So there's, there's a lot of technicalities that have to be ironed out. This is still the, the early days of, of trying to figure this out. Uh, in, in your case, the reason why you have to do that is because fundamentally a stock cannot be split apart. So you have to basically play a trick where if you sell two halves, you have to have one hole. If you sell three halves, you have to have two holes. And you probably just shelve the other half somewhere in the file cabinet, waiting for someone else to buy half a share. In this case, because it's uh, digital, you can go down to the eighth decimal place if you really want to. 
Obviously, there's a certain point where it doesn't make it financially feasible. You're not going to spend, you know, 0.5 cents on a Picasso. It's just math to work out. But that's one of the game changers of, of, of cryptocurrency and blockchain is that what was once whole, you can now make fractional. Now, one last point on that. The crypto kitties don't do that. They're a whole different type of contract uh, that's called non-fungible, which means you can't break it apart. It's one token equals one thing. It's, it's completely unique, and you can't, you can't dissect the cat, essentially. Does that make sense? Um, there's even one more step beyond that. There's actually tokens that can be owned by other tokens. So there's, there's non-fungible tokens that can be owned by other non-fungible tokens. You can have a crypto kitty who's drinking out of a purple bowl that is itself completely unique, and a cat toy that is also unique. So there's, there's a lot of really cool things that can be done. So for possession rights, you may have a non-fungible token. For ownership rights, we'll have a fungible token that represents fractional ownership. If that makes sense. Go ahead. So Last question. Okay. Yep. So why is the money to be made on this? Like, uh, I'm sorry, I saw something that uh, this also is yep. in there. I saw something. So, so we are making the uh, money currently. Yeah. Not in this new world, like, it's all a little bit of thing, like, or is it like, is it still to be extra kind of uh, um, for the most part, transaction fees. For the most part, the way that uh, a lot of these types of systems are, are making a sort of money is on every transaction, there's some micro amount being shaved off. Uh, and the cool thing, too, is that you can take fees not only in the payment of the cryptocurrency, you can also take fees in the percentage of the asset. You can actually now pay uh, your bills in percentage of assets because the, the percentage of the asset is itself almost like a currency. When you can shave off, $10 of a, of a Picasso every day, you can, you can you know, buy your coffee and you can convert correctly. So that's one of the other things too, is that fractional assets actually almost turns into a whole different payment net. That line. Great, thank you. Stick around. I think Kate's going to be speaking next. Is that right? Yep. Yes. All right, stick around. Awesome.